that's you're moving it back to a thousand years ago what yes we've gone through the industrial revolution and all these different things what has the church then lost that we are trying to recover and do you see it being lost globally or is it something that's more of a western phenomenon that has then a trick that that has kind of jump the the seas if you will because of the influence of the the western church on the world that it's starting to trickle into those other churches i think there's quite a difference globally to begin with although uh the same kind of problems we're having are spreading around the globe at, a, at an amazing rate so uh, that said uh, the the biggest problems in the in the western church happened with four great ideas that sort of ruined the church so in the Enlightenment, uh, we start with, um, I think, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. And so that raised thinking to the most important thing about humans. And what they meant by thinking was uh, conscious, logical sort of thoughts. And so the church thought, well, you know, if you want to think and you want logical thoughts, you want truth, uh, we've got truth. So we then started making truth available to culture. Uh, the only problem is that at that point, truth began to eclipse love as the um, as a, as our central message. Uh, we began mm -hmm. arguing about truth, and then the voluntarists came along and he said, "Well, it doesn't matter what you believe if you can't make a choice." So making the right choice became the sort of the central thing for the gospel. And so we made becoming a Christian, a choosing Jesus as your savior and the solution to all problems were making better choices. You hear that all around the church in the West. Don't hear that much in the Eastern church or a mm. lot of other cultures, but we, you know, and, and of course we want to make good choices, but that doesn't make as big a difference as who we love. And after that, then, came the will to power. What's the point in having uh, uh, having a will and making choices if you don't have the power to have it? And so Nietzsche and all the power people came along and the Nazis and other people that wanted to implement that power. So, and Christianity, they went to power as well. You know, we're gonna have powerful experience. You know, you don't have a Christianity without power. So we began looking for whatever was a powerful thing. And so, the most common th comment I hear about worship is, wow, that was powerful because that's, you know, the value we picked up. And of course, we don't want to have inert Christianity, right? But power is not as important as who you love. And then when the truth and the right choices and the power of the spirit, all of those were failing to do things like prevent divorces and the rest of that, the church then went with culture in the direction of, well, if you're going to be loving, what you, that means is you're just going to be tolerant of everybody. And so at this junction in culture, uh, we have people being tolerant and, and defining love as being just accepting of everybody else. Um, and, you know, because there's really nothing you can do about the problems of the world anyway. Now, in the rest of the world, I think the operant condition is that they're surrounded by enemies of Christianity. And when you're surrounded by enemies of Christianity, the only thing that really digs in and helps you is if you can spontaneously love your enemies. And that practice, you, well, you know the truth. Every, everyone could tell you you should love your enemies. That the, knowing the truth hasn't made anyone that I know of love them. Uh, trying to uh, make better choices, like I'm just gonna love them, you know, doesn't do it. I mean, all these things don't work. Um, as a formula, because the only thing that makes us love our enemies is when we love God and we see his love for our, our enemies as well. We share that love and go like, well, yeah, God loved me when I needed help. Uh, how can I not love the people that he loves? And so that shared love, which is part of non-Western cultures uh, in communities very often, it just makes sense to them. This is what we do. And, and if you're living that life of loving the people that God loves, uh, even before they love you back, you know, while they're still enemies. Uh, and I think God was that way before, while we were still his enemies, he loved us. That is the thing that, that transforms people because they understand, you know, in the relational context already, you know, if you become, uh, if I love you, you will become one of my people. And especially if, 
I, I remember growing up in South America, as soon as someone became a Christian, uh, the, they were part of the group trying to kill us. Mm. And they had to be taken into our group immediately and become one of our people if they were going to survive, because now their people were trying to kill them. And so this sense that, you know, if we make this change of kingdoms, um, we must enter into relationship and share life together is really very prominent in the areas where Christianity uh, is much more transforming than it is in the West.